that kind of flexibility we call embodied flexibility. And I think both of you are, are sneaking up on that. If you don't actually already have it, you're very close to having it in your hip movements. Once you've got that, both of you, you'll have it for life. That's, that's a promise. You won't even need to do it very often. Once every two or three weeks will be enough. And I know people will say, oh, that's not possible. You've got to stretch every day to be flexible, blah, 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 blah. It's nonsense. And it's always written and spoken about by people who are themselves not flexible and who can't actually demonstrate their stuff themselves. Now, you, you two can demonstrate. You, you're walking the walk and talking the talk. It's like Emmett. I've watched Emmett become super flexible in front splits over the last few years or so. And so, of course, I'm going to listen to what he has to say on front splits, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, look, I don't know whether that's helpful or not, but with your athletes, none of this stuff, unless you're working with men who are doing um, gymnastic, men's gymnastic strength training, where those key ranges of movement are actually necessary in order to be able to do, you know, hanging from a bar and touching your feet to a bar or the V up and all those other things. Um, if you're working with team sport athletes, and I think most of you work with footballers, don't you? A bit of a... Yeah, basketball, football, yeah, the okay. old athlete. Well, in my opinion, then, the, the great utility of flexibility training for those people is not about acquiring new range of movement, which, of course, is our own personal interest. No, mm. it's, it's actually about finding out what the body needs and unwinding and getting rid of any little fascial problems before they manifest as an injury. And if you are paying attention to what's going on in your body as you stretch, well, I like to say... Your body is talking to you all the time, but what we unfortunately in our culture have done, because money is so important and because people subject themselves to a daily life, which I regard as torture, frankly, like working in an office, sitting down, and the body saying to you, oh my God, I have to get up and move around. And you say, no, I have to have this finished by close of business and all of those kinds of things. Most people that we know are at war with themselves in that regard. And so what they've done, whether they are aware of it or not, is they've actually learned they've actually trained themselves how not to listen to the body. And so that the remaking of that conversation has to begin first before you can actually hear what the body has to say. And in my experience, nothing will bring that process about quicker than learning how to relax while you're in a stretch position. If you can, and, and so this means, of course, and Olivia has, has been talking about this for years, and of course I ignored it, but she's absolutely right. If you want to explore pelvic movement in the pancake, it's her favorite example, and she's a master at it. Um, you can't even move your pelvis if you're in a stretch position, right? You've, you've washed your people, or you know, they've got their, their butt up on something to help gravity move them forward and all the rest of it. But if they're in the full stretch position already, their position can't be corrected. So what you do is you bring them out of that full stretch position. You, you let them go into it just to show you where, that, where not to work. You bring them out of that position and you say, okay, now feel how those muscles relax. Now try to move the pelvis backwards and forwards. Feel that movement. That's the movement that you need in the pancake, that movement. And, you know, it's like a light bulb coming on. You can see people, once they can feel it, it's got nothing to do with what's going on in the mind. What, whatever ideas they have about flexibility, those ideas will be, I hate to use this word, but it's, it's the right word, trumped, and isn't that a, a hideous concept right away? But those, those the ideas about stretching will be trumped immediately by the physical experience with that freedom of movement. And so that's once that movement is experienced, then the person can learn how to become flexible. And strength is so important to men. Now, I said that I'd come back to this, so let me talk about female flexibility for a moment. Women, generally speaking, have looser fascia than men do. They're not as strong in the upper body for the most part, but of course we're seeing CrossFit athletes these days who are equally as strong as most men in the upper body now, but this is a relatively new phenomenon. And in fact, the woman who's the top CrossFit practitioner, is it, is it Kristen, Kirsten? Her flexibility, she was a gymnast before she became too tall her flexibility is superb it's perfect side splits and front splits she's got that already but the the problem of how to take an adult body and making it that flexible that problem still remains and in my experience it's all about acquiring strength and also in, in parallel process to this we strongly recommend this in all of our work 
and this is this is actually gold i think for all athletes uh athletes have to learn how to be relaxed now the best athletes are already relaxed as i said people like ben johnson the best basketball players are relaxed you can you can see it clearly they move beautifully they move like animals and that's the greatest compliment i can pay to anyone anyone who can move like a cat as far as i'm concerned that's aces in my book and very few humans move like that right we are much more dog-like than cat-like And let me just explore that idea for a moment because this is not an obvious thing. Why is it that cats are so much more flexible and it should also be said, and this is the hook for athlete to be interested in this thing, why are cats of any size about 70% more powerful than dogs of the same size? And that is accurate. That's what the ethologists tell us. Why are they so much more powerful? And why are they so much more relaxed? You know, when you pick up a cat, mm-hmm. they're so relaxed that one end hangs down off your hand here and the other end, you, feel, you pick them up, right? And you think, God, they, they don't have any bones in their body. But in fact, their skeletons, are the, their skeletons are virtually identical apart from the shape of their teeth and the shapes of their claws. Yeah. What is the big difference? There are a few. What, what do you think? They're lazy. <laughs> that, 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 that is accurate. Um, ad, adult male lions uh, rest about 16 hours a day. Yeah. Okay, so that's definitely part of the equation, but there's more. What else do you think? I think they know when to use the energy they need to use, um, and they reserve it for those times, and all other times they just, you know, they, they, they just have that innate ability to, to just be relaxed when they, you know, I guess under any circumstances which they don't feel threatened or need to react. Well, that, that, that is a, that's very insightful, Jeffrey, because here's a little, uh, as, a, as an ex-philosopher, that's what I was doing at university, philosophy is my main research area. We talk about Gedanken, it's a German word, it means thought experiment. Here's a thought experiment. Your cat, let's say you've got a cat, it's lying in the sun in the backyard, I'm being cat-like now, if you, if you couldn't see that, I'm being cat-like. Um, when I say it's lying in the backyard, there's a big difference between cats being asleep and their normal state. Their normal state is a state of meditation, a state of deep, deep relaxation, but they're totally aware. How do we know this? When you walk into a room where there's a cat, if, you're fav- if you are a favoured person, you'll, you'll get an ear twitch in your direction. One ear will actually aim itself in your direction just to make sure it is actually you and then the, the ear will go back to the relaxed position, right? That's yeah. a big acknowledgement from a cat. But when you walk into a room where there's a dog, it's a whole different story. The dog looks at you like this mm-hmm. and they want to know, and they want to know, am I in your good books right now or I'm in your bad books? And the reason I say that is they've just torn up two rolls of toilet paper and the whole lounge room is covered with toilet paper. If you've ever owned dogs, you know this is a true story. Now, here's the thing. When you walk into a room where a dog is, that dog's sole locus of attention is on you, right? Mm -hmm. It is, how do you, am I in your good books? Am I in your bad books? What do you think about me right now? (laughs) You know that? Inviting reaction from you. And what's the cat's response? An ear twitch. Now here's the thing. The locus of attention point is a critical one for human beings because the vast majority of human beings cannot be cat-like in this regard. They actually care way too much about what other people are thinking about them all the time. And why is that significant? Because when the locus of attention is outside yourself, your muscle tension is increased. Mm. When a cat is lying there, being a cat, they, as you said, Lucas, they are totally relaxed dogs are very rarely totally relaxed they are sometimes there and certainly there are cats there are dogs that are more cat-like but let me give you another thought experiment the cat's lying in the backyard and the and and someone's left the gate open and the neighbor's dog runs in sees the cat runs over to it and starts barking at it and attacking it right what does the cat do the cat does nothing until the, the dog makes contact with it there's a blur of activity 
a split second or so and the dog is has its nose slashed and the and the dog then runs off barking and up, upset and that dog will stay upset for an hour or two after that encounter have you had dogs have you seen this yeah, yeah. but yeah, what's yeah. the but what is the cat doing one minute after that interaction right back to the state because in a cat's world that that was a momentary perturbation to the normal state and they can instantly relax back into that state and that's what i've spent the last 25 years of my life trying to acquire as a human being that is a state of muscle tonus which is so relaxed i can still move incredibly quickly when i have to or when i need to and i can generate force in my muscles when i need to but and this plays into your point jeffrey cats don't feel threatened most of the time they are relaxed genuinely relaxed whereas dogs and humans experience their life as stressful and they do consider themselves to be under threat a lot of the time and that's the difference and there's one more difference cats lick every square inch of their own body apart from that little patch between their eyebrows every day without fail now dogs also clean parts of themselves but it's a much a much smaller set of movements that they use to do that and so what you're looking at when you watch a cat licking itself is literally the most sophisticated yoga routine the planet has ever developed it is all the major poses all the angles and spaces between the major poses and they do it every day from when they're kittens it's hardwired into their system so again watching the way a cat works will not help a dog or a human become flexible that's the point i'm making cats are much more like dancers or gymnasts who've become flexible as children it's a key thing and no one ever talks about this but that is the main and the and the, the lesson for athletes is if you want to run fast you have to be completely relaxed when you run now and that's what i mean about emulating cats if you look at there's a national geographic high speed photography of that cheetah running at 70 miles an hour chasing whatever that thing that they set up the body of that cheetah is completely relaxed and yet the whole body is tensing and relaxing tensing and relaxing it's a whole body thing it goes from massive spinal extension where the legs are parallel to the ground to full contraction where the legs are underneath each other the front legs are back here and the back legs are here that's how humans can run when they're completely relaxed like ben johnson looks amazing when he runs michael what's it, what's his name is it michael johnson the, the very upright sprinter oh yeah if you yeah. look at a photograph of him and i'll i'll send you my favorite one but if you search on him you'll see this photograph he's wearing the gold nike shoes he is off the ground about six inches both feet are off the ground and his back leg while he's in mid air is in 40 degrees of extension at the hip joint and his back is straight and his lumbar spine is not hyperextended almost none of your athletes have that degree of flexibility in their back leg they just don't have it now if you want to jump high this is for your basketball players i know they can all jump god they're amazing to watch but to improve someone's vertical jump stretch their hip flexors yeah. that's the key you probably already do this but it is the key because it unlocks the glutes maximum extension capacity and talking now about runners the runners that pull their hamstrings and lots of footballers pull their hamstrings and yes there are i mean if particularly in your style of football football there are massive trauma injuries on field i'm not talking about those kinds of things but i'm talking about when someone changes direction or when they're trying to accelerate and they pull a hamstring <clears throat> that is the evidence that their hip flexors are not loose enough for that extra fraction of a degree of stride length you they have to have hip flexors that are looser than what that demand requires when they're sprinting flat out, in my opinion, anyway. Anyway, I've talked a lot of different things there, but generally speaking, yeah. humans are more, are more dog-like than cat-like, unfortunately. So we, we like to say we think part of the program 
that athletes need to embark on or, or at least could consider embarking on is trying to move themselves from being more dog-like to more cat-like. So less reactive, uh, more relaxed, practice all of their movements, trying to be as relaxed as possible and use the the licking or the advanced stretching routine only as a means of uncovering future in, uh, future injuries and also to calm the neural system down so that rest and recovery can happen as it's intended to, to happen. Yeah, I w just to, to interject on this, it's, it's an interesting, it's actually something I talk about. Um, and the reason why is Yep, listening. Is I have experience training uh, American football. Um, we we don't train them anymore. Um, I, I, honestly, it's it's just it's so much. But part of that is that exact thing right there is it, when I train, for instance, even when I squat. Sometimes my best squat sessions have been with like classical music, where I'm just totally relaxed and and I, you know I don't have all this extra um, super loud music and just oh. super high up tension and. Um, and, and unfortunately, in like a gym, that's the training culture, right? And so you get these high schoolers who come in and they're they're screaming and they're yelling and they're hitting each other and they're, you know, it's just, it's constant, just like, it's almost like anarchy in the gym all of a sudden. And it's exhausting. For us, it was exhausting just being in the gym with them for an hour. Just the energy is so high. Um, yep, yep. And it's interesting to note, I have a friend who went to, uh, who's actually in Hong Kong, but he went to uh, mainland China to train at a, a Chinese weightlifting gym there. Oh. And it was fascinating to hear that his biggest observation that he made, and he, he went to university here in the States. He's actually a, a basketball player himself, but um, was, it was interesting that he noted um, that what stuck out him, to him the most was that the training atmosphere was extremely, extremely relaxed in, at a national, I mean, they're, 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 you know, they're training youth for national level. Um, it's a feeder school. And he said it was the most relaxed training environment he's ever been in. These kids, they walk up to this rack, they squat over double body weight, put the weight back, like nothing happened. And then they walk over and hang out and just kind of laugh. And they're, they're just super, super relaxed. And I thought that was like a very interesting point. And it's probably one of the biggest reasons for their success. And, you know, the Chinese system alone actually has like very minimal injuries and their mm -hmm. athletes are, are incredibly strong. Now, granted, they have a huge, um, a huge pool system, very much like the Russians, you know, there's probably millions of weightlifters within their country, but just, uh, it was just interesting to me that that was his observation of, of all things. Like I'm waiting to hear all the juicy details, right? Like, and he's just like, Oh, they were just, extremely relaxed like it was they're just hanging out at, you know a bunch of kids hanging out at the it was really it was just an interesting observation i thought and it just goes right in line with exactly what you just said and um yeah i i i tend to to gravitate more even during heavy strength training to a much much more relaxed training environment in fact i actually for the most part like training by myself because of that reason because i can just be totally calm and relaxed and i don't have to hype up before i train and i you know i think lucas is kind of the same way so Mm. Yeah, it's definitely uh, definitely interesting so lucas what's your take on that if i may ask well i am uh formerly a power lifter like at a pretty high level so my adrenal glands are exhausted <laughs> <laughs> yep but uh yeah like I, I flexibility for me what it's taught me is is everything that you're talking about um i'm on a whole new wavelength in my life in my training and my practice and uh, that's what I teach. That's something like I've recognized and realized that this is, this is what we need to teach to the world and the people need to recognize those things. And the way you uh, just kind of uh, worded it there, kid, like the locus of attention uh, point. And that's like, that's the number one struggle with trying to teach people how to stretch is no one is actually ever stretched unless they've had an attention point on a stretch for as long as two years. Yes. And, uh, I mean, that's always question number one, like, have you actually stretched before? And people are like, well, what do you mean? Of course I have. It's like, um, you know, so yeah, I think that hits home for me for sure. Coming from my background and like, that's, that's why I'm sitting here with uh, you guys today to talk about it is because yeah, like that's just, 
something that we need to uh, to teach and get out there in the world and, and have people recognize that and, and recognize like there's another way avenue we could probably dive into like we had kind of before this podcast went back and forth on a few ideas and stuff but you know Jeff and I do talk about yoga a lot like in terms of like maybe it not being the best place for people to start because you're going in there like maybe for that aspect of it you can find relaxation in a yoga class but for, for a lot of individuals it's almost like uh your your initial experiences that you had kit with like your limber classes and stuff like you can't really keep up in the class and stuff and i know you have a very extensive yoga background and I think our listeners, you know, that have listened to Jeff and I talk about it before would appreciate hearing some of your perspectives on that kind of side of the coin as well. Well, I do have a, yeah, I do have an extensive yeah, a background in yoga. That's true. Um, but I, <clears throat> the, the elephant in the room in respect of yoga practice is the goal of yoga and, and the word yoga itself, the Sanskrit root, is a, a, a Sanskrit word, yuj, meaning to join. The goal of yoga is, is actually a completely different goal to what most people who play with yoga and most people who are thinking about yoga understand. The, if, if I could sum it up in my own way, this is not what, say, Mr. Ryanga would say. He would say, the goal of yoga is equanimity. Now, he, he, he was very big on this, and we'll come back to that point because my wife, my partner, Olivia, said something to me once um, which has actually changed our dual respective direction since then. I'll come back to that point. But Mr. Ayinga said there are plenty of dancers and gymnasts who can get into all the advanced yoga poses, but they're not doing yoga. And, mm. and he said they do not display the quality that yoga is designed to bestow upon its practitioners, that is equanimity. Now, equanimity is an interesting word because, and it's a word that I think doesn't connect to a lot of Westerners, but what you two have been talking about and what I mentioned, but, but, it, but you both picked up on it, is the state of relaxation. A state of relaxation is just a starting point, isn't it? And it's the quality that distinguishes cats and dogs the most profoundly, I think. When a person, when a human being is internally deeply relaxed, just like that fight between a dog and a cat that I mentioned, you can deal with a perturbation to your environment, someone screaming at you or yelling at you or something going wrong or whatever, and it will perturb you momentarily. You'll adapt to that or respond to that in the moment and adapt to it or put things in place, um, whether it be internally or whether, you know, in terms of your planning so that that is able to be avoided in the future if it's a negative experience and so on. But here's the key thing. The perturbation is the exception, not the rule. Now, most people experience their life in a state of perturbation. Most people don't like the job that they do. They're working for a boss who they may or may not respect, but in any case puts pressure on them all the time. They borrowed too much money, so they feel the pressure of having to pay things back and they have to get the money back in. And all and and the worst part of modern life for most people is social media. I have seen people see something on social media, they'll be out to dinner, it's classic, a classic story. Olivia and I were in a, a sports bar in New York City once, about three years ago, I think. And a group of people, they're all wearing, what reminded me is looking at my own um, jumper for a moment, or we call these jumpers, I think you call them sweaters. They were all wearing purple t-shirts and all had the company logo on their chest. And all six of them were sitting around a table, ostensibly having a drink and something to eat after work. But all six of them were on their phones to other people. And the sole interaction for this hour that we saw them together was they'd look at the phone, flip through things, laugh at something, show the group that quickly, and then go back to... And that was the extent of their interaction. I thought that was remarkable. Anyway, the social media also increases your resting muscle tension in every way because you're, it, it is the, the acme, if you like, or the pinnacle of um, caring what other people think about you. 
It's how this plays out in the modern world. Oh my God, I've got 10,000 likes. People like me. Or, oh my God, I don't have 10,000 likes. People must hate me. It looks just that endless dialogue that goes on in the mind. And so, for me personally, learning how to relax, to actually relax, was the single greatest gift I ever gave myself. And it was really only in the last 10 years that the whole relaxation dimension has explicitly um, become front and centre in our work. For us, the stretching exercises are a way of just finding out what part of the body I can't relax. You can think about flexibility that way. It's a completely different way of thinking about it, not range of movement based. It's, I get into this position, my shoulder's a bit sore today, I'll get to this position here like this, I'll take the arm back behind me and twist it around until I find that tight line and just stay with that for a moment and feel that. And then I feel it letting go now. I, I feel it letting go. And then a little bit more movement is possible. I feel it letting go. I feel it letting go. The point of mentioning this is I've become an expert in letting go of tension in my own body. That's the point. And anyone can learn this. And, and here's the key thing. Most of us unconsciously have learned how to be experts in holding tension in our own bodies. That's what we've got a PhD in. I have a PhD in being reactive and tense, let's say. And how do I unlock that? Well, the first thing is, and we, we've got a, I teach um, a, an approach to meditation in Buddhist monasteries in Asia. I've been doing this for about the last seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the very few Western teachers, along with a colleague of mine who are invited. It's like taking cold in Newcastle, we would say. That's, that's the English expression because Newcastle is a cold town, right? So you're not going to be mm -hmm. able to sell a coal if you take cold in Newcastle. You would think that as Westerners going back into the, the home of Buddhism that we would not be able to teach anything there, but that turns out not to be the case because the modern generation and most of our students are Chinese have exactly the same problems with not being able to relax, not being able to sit in a classic medita meditation posture. They got problems in their back and problems in their neck and all the other things that are related to holding too much tension in the body and not just too much tension, it's asymmetric tension, but that's a whole nother conversation. Uh, and so I found that the my lying relaxation or lying meditation, I should take a little step sideways here and say, in a, in a very famous uh, sutra, the Buddha spoke of the four postures of meditation, but really only one of those four postures has become considered proper meditation in the West, and that's sitting meditation. In fact, the Buddha spoke of moving meditation, standing meditation, lying meditation, and seated meditation. But for all sorts of reasons, and some of those reasons are fascist too, and I don't mind calling this out. If you can't sit in full lotus, you can't meditate. I've heard people say that. That is just complete nonsense. In fact, the most popular meditation position is called the Burmese position, where one leg is next to your body and the other leg is on the floor in front of it. Um, I, I've got a, a, a how to sit for meditation video on YouTube. We, um, which will go through all of those things. But, but I remember one of, the, one of the most enlightened people I ever worked with, he had a congenital hip um, problem, and he, in fact, wasn't able to cross his legs, so, and yet he managed to transcend the limited sense of self. And I'll get back to this point, because that really is what yoga is all about. But I'll, I'll digress. I'll come back to that in a moment. So the, the teacher couldn't even sit cross-legged on a couch, but he nonetheless managed to do all the internal work that um, yoga talks about and meditation talks about and managed to transform himself. Now, what do I mean by transform? And this is the key thing here. If you're not a deeply relaxed person who can respond in each moment non-reflexively to the challenges of that moment, and that's, <clears throat> again, exactly what cats do, they'll be in this state they will do the minimum necessary, as you said, Jeffrey, they're lazy. I think you said cats are lazy. They are essentially lazy. Yes, they conserve their energy. And yet if you watch how cats train, it's fascinating. Here's a classic cat training thing. They'll be lying in that meditation position. They'll get up and they'll do the cat pose and the dog pose the way they do and then stretch one leg out behind them. That's their hip flexor stretch and then the other leg out behind them. 
That's their second hip flexor stretch. And then they'll go and run up a tree, full power. No warm up. And certainly when the dog comes through the back gate, they don't say, excuse me, I just have to stretch my hamstrings. No, they <laughs> enjoy a state where the body's full power is available and body's full flexibility is available all the time. Mm, yeah. That's what we want. And how are we going to get it? We don't get it. Well, we, of course, partly we get it by becoming stronger in the gym. We certainly help it by becoming agile and, and more mobile in our movement patterns and movement patterns are, are really what we teach. I mean, flexibility is just one end of it. The strength work, like you're saying, full squats, for example, that's just another end of it, another particular, but we're teaching movement patterns, right? Collectively, that's what we teach, even though we might not position it that way. But when we talk about how, this is a good time to bring in the, the Olivia story. We were considering working with a, a Taoist teacher at one point, and his practices, like many of the Taoist practices, are extremely elaborate, just like the Tibetan Buddhist form of Buddhism is extremely elaborate in terms of visualization and the Theravadan approach to Buddhism is much plainer and ordinary compared to the, 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 the um, Tibetan version. And so even within yoga, even within Buddhism, there are many, many, many different schools and there's hundreds of schools of yoga, for example, and some of those schools don't even do any physical postures. So I will get around to answering your original question in a moment. <clears throat> so now I've lost my train of thought. Where was I? You and Olivia were thinking. Oh, Olivia, we, thank you, thank you. We were talking and she just said to me directly, she said, I'm only interested in practices that will help me become a better human being. And I thought, hmm, that is very deep. And that, of course, has been my own program too, but I had not articulated that to myself. So for me, the, and I, I haven't mentioned this yet, but I did spend six months on retreat in a place in New Mexico, a place, a little town called Taos. And the only practices I did, apart from one sitting meditation practice a day, I did between four and six lying meditation practices. And that six month period totally changed my body and myself, I would say, forever. Because I do this on workshops, I say to people, um, I'll be standing in the middle of the room and I say, look, I just want to show you that the tension that you hold is not actually necessary. And people, I love it when people feel a bit provoked by things that I say, because that's, you know, that you might be, able, it's a little hook, you might be able to make a connection there. And I'll say, no, seriously, come over and poke me. Whether, you, whether it be poke into the neck, poke into my tummy, poke into my back muscles, press the leg muscles or whatever, you'll find that my body's relaxed while I'm standing up. That's about alignment. Now you've both done handstand practice and all that kind of thing. You'll know that yeah. it doesn't require strength if you can align your body in a particular way. Mm -hmm. But it will require a huge amount of work, especially for men who are tight in the thoracic spine to get that mobility to be able to organize that body in that way. So anyway, by, by being more relaxed more of the time, in my own daily life, you'll find when something goes wrong or the shit hits the fan in some way, instead of reflexively responding in the way that you're hardwired, and each of us is hardwired to re respond in a particular way. For example, in the old days, I was a very angry person. And when I say that now, a lot of people have a lot of trouble believing me because they say, oh, but you're so relaxed. Yeah, look, and we've all seen plenty of people who look relaxed on the surface, but the moment you poke them, um, you know, they spit out at you. That's not being relaxed. That's just faking being relaxed. That's um, wearing relaxation as a mask. And, you know, if you push someone hard enough, the mask can't be sustained, if I can put it that way. So I made it my goal to, to try and be as relaxed as possible in normal daily life. And I found that lying relaxation for me personally was the, the quick way into doing that. And I would say for most Westerners, rather than developing a meditation practice first, it would be a much, much better thing to learn how to fully relax first. And then once you have felt 
what being relaxed feels like, then you can, we talk about building a meditation posture, sitting in a particular way, you align your legs in a particular way, pelvis in a particular way, tilt the pelvis forward slightly, lift the chest slightly, bring the chin back slightly, let the shoulders drop, relax your tummy completely. Well, those instructions won't mean anything to you if you don't know what having a relaxed tummy or a relaxed neck or relaxed shoulders feels like. And this is what we've noticed was the big problem with the Chinese students that we were working with in Asia is they had heard these directions before, but they didn't know how to do it. And most Westerners, if you push them and say, look, God, you, you must relax, you need to relax. Most people's response will be something like this. What do you mean? I am relaxed. Right? Yeah. It's not real. Yeah. And we want the real thing, if I can put it that way. And the only way to do that is to directly and many, many times feel what the feeling of being deep, deeply relaxed actually feels like. Not as a concept, not as an idea between your ears, but as a state in the physical body. Now, once you have felt that, and you might have practiced it a bit, then the embodiment part of it starts and then you when you the thing that is interesting to me is that as you become more flexible and this again was not something that i expected but in fact i think it's the most important part of it let's say you're sitting at the desk and you're typing away if you are a bit more flexible you'll feel your shoulders lifting like this you'll actually feel that artificial tension manifesting in the body but because you can feel it and you're aware of it you say ah oh, i'll just let my shoulders relax now now the people that you work with who cannot relax they whatever you say to them will not have that effect i know this is only a simple case but it, it makes the larger point doesn't it you have to know it has to be a feeling in the body of what being relaxed is before you can then reinvoke it. Now I had a, an, an interaction the other day with a guy who runs the the club next to our house here, and he was angry. He was very unhappy about some questions that I was asking him. And he's a big guy, about six foot four, and he walked over to him and he loomed over the top of me in a very threatening way. But that kind of um, what's the word? Display, I think it's the right word. That kind of display, speaking as someone who worked on the door of an iClub for a couple of years, this is during my professional boxing phase, that kind of display has literally no effect on me at all. And I could see him check himself. He saw that the display that he was manifesting, that sort of alpha male, I'm telling you how it's going to be a display, was having absolutely no effect on me at all. And so he backed off a bit. How do you think it would have been had I responded, put a hand out and pushed him in the chest or something? Then it would have been on, right? That's what I'm talking about, being relaxed enough to be able to make that choice in that moment. This, this to me is a, a skill that human beings can really manifest and grow from in the current times because it's not how most people live. And then for the that whole relaxation dimension is what you then bring into your stretching practice. You're in a position. How can I let go of that? Again, once you've had the experience of letting go, letting go, letting go, you will be able to let go. But if you can't let go, then pushing back in the opposite direction identifies the place where the tension can't be let go of. And the reciprocal inhibition reflex and the post-contraction inhibition reflex, let's say, both of those together will allow you momentarily to lengthen into that range of movement. Then you spend some time there, you feel it, you move around, use what we call micro movements there, move out of it, move back into it again, and you find that's now a new range of movement. And that's how the whole program moves. It's like it's, you have to learn how to relax first. Say again? Like you have to learn how to relax and to do first before it's it's a it's like going from zero to 60 on your flexibility yes, yes. So, you know what i mean yeah. so yeah that's 
And, and, and there's no reason why you can't practice both things together because what we have found, I wouldn't like to say it's not a chicken and egg thing, or actually it is a chicken and egg thing in another sense. We can't say, no, the, the, the best way to become more flexible is to learn how to relax first because, you know, half your students will go. They just won't be interested in doing that. You can introduce those ideas as you are doing the physical stretching and that will completely change the experience of the stretching. And so the thing that we discovered recently or relatively recently, which is about now we say you take, after you've done the contraction, let's say, you take a breath in and we say, we don't say in the period of the breath out, move deeper into the stretch. We don't say that now. We say, take a breath in and as you breathe out, let your tummy go completely soft. Don't move, don't move out of the stretch position. Don't do anything else. Just let the tummy go completely soft. Is it soft yet? And on workshops, we do this all the time. I'll always choose a guy to do this. Your tummy's soft, can I probe it? It won't be soft at all, of course. They'll be holding themselves like this. And I said, no, I, I will then say, no, I mean soft, soft. Let it go soft. And then they let the tummy go soft because a, a hand on the tummy instantly signals how to do that to the person. And they say, oh, you mean soft? And here's, here's the, the crack up is, yeah, what the fuck? That's just what I said, soft. But soft <laughs> is a concept. Soft is a concept. And it's not an experience in that person. As soon as they feel it, it goes from conceptual to experiential. And that can be felt and remembered by the body. This is gold, honestly. It's such a subtle, small thing. And then we say, okay, that's, that's soft. Now take in another breath. Let that softness stay with you as you move a bit further into the stretch. Don't go too far. Now, that new position, hold that, breathe, breathe and relax. Ask yourself, can you let your tummy go soft again? Because inevitably, as you move into that deeper position, you will have tightened back up again. And then we'll say something like, and don't beat yourself up about this. This is the protective reflex manifesting in your body. This is the fight or flight response. Any time the physical body is threatened or feels threatened, it has never in the history of humans responded by opening, lengthening and relaxing. No, it's closing, protecting, tightening. It's hardwired. And so once you make that explicit to your students, they, they some of them, ah, okay, I get, ah, oh, that's what you mean. Okay. So they let themselves go into a stretch position and then I'll say, and, and are you letting yourself go completely soft? And someone will say, I'm having a bit of trouble doing that. And I said, I will say something like, well, understand you're not under threat here. This sometimes that's the key term that can open that little nut. You're not under, you're, you're among friends, you're among people who like you. Now just let your whole body go soft. And I remember a woman on a workshop um, in London and she said, oh, you mean let the whole body go soft. I know I'm just repeating myself, but it's so funny because this is this, this immense gap between conceptual and experiential. A lot of people for all kinds of life history reasons or stress or trauma or whatever in their background or injury in the case of our athletes, they cannot let that part go soft because it feels threatening to them. That must be spoken about explicitly and yeah. the context made explicit. So, okay, here, take a bit of a chance, let your tummy go soft and see if your arms fall off. I'll sometimes say that on workshops too. So far, no arms have fallen off. You know, you have to make a joke about these things if you can. Yeah. Anyway, so, so, so look, to tie up the, the, hold on to that thought, to tie up the thought that started this stream, for most people, unless you're interested in getting into the spiritual side of yoga, for most people, for athletes and for any non-athletic people, um, it's a, it's a crapshoot as to whether or not you're going to find a really good teacher. And in my opinion, finding a really good teacher is the secret to any discipline it doesn't matter. I've had so many people say, oh, look, um, you do stretching. Is that like Pilates? They'll say, is that like Pilates or is that like yoga? Now, it's such a crazy question because firstly, when you ask them, almost never have they ever done any yoga or any Pilates. So what does saying it's like Pilates or not like Pilates actually mean? It means nothing. It's just words, words. Mm -hmm. And so if someone says, yeah, I've been told that yoga is really good for me, I would always say, well, that, oh, that's, that's interesting. In what way? 
is yoga good for you? You see what I'm getting at? And so if you if you come across a good yoga teacher, I urge you to study with that person because only benefits will come your way. But the byproduct of that practice will be the flexibility that you're seeking. It won't be the purpose of it. And you'll learn how to breathe in fairly esoteric ways. I mean, there are eight limbs to yoga. Patanjali spoke about the eight limbs of yoga. And Ashtanga yoga now calls itself, that's Ashtanga, um, that guy, Patabi Joyce, who was also a contemporary of, of Iyengar's, um, decided to position his yoga that way as, a, as an homage to Patanjali, who originally wrote about the eight limbs of yoga. Um, there are some schools of yoga that only do chanting. Kirit, kirtan it's called and there are some schools of yoga that only meditate they don't do any physical postures at all and they don't do any chanting so when someone says is what you do like yoga i have to say no it's, it's not like yoga or yes it is like yoga and and confuse them and and then they'll ask well, what do you mean by that and I say well we do we our practices are all about making the body softer about making the body more flexible and about body, making the body more relaxed so you know, whatever athletic endeavor you're involved in, so on can can come more easily to you. Does that sound interesting? Or maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't. But the thing is, what we are doing is really not like anything else as far as I can see. And I, I would not recommend against anyone studying yoga, of course. I wouldn't recommend against that at all. And what I would just say, though, is exactly the same as, as, as Pilates or any other system. Find a good teacher. Find, ask yourself, is this human being displaying the kind of characteristics that um, I would like to embody? The, I, not to not to um, copy this person, but this is the kind of person, the, this is the kind of human being that I would like to be like. And I can say that about a few of my teachers for sure, because I've been very lucky. I've been able to work with some extraordinarily gifted teachers. It's sort of a very long answer to your question, but because um, most go on no i was just saying i love it i love uh, your perspective finding a good teacher is actually um well they have a saying look at this all this work whether you're talking about um buddhism meditation or whether you're talking about yoga the the authentic schools of yoga or the traditional schools of yoga or anything else, whether you're talking about Eckhart Tolle's work, The Power of Now, that guy that wrote that book. Um, the the never-changing truths that these systems all speak to, they're all the same. They are not different. Yes, they're spoken about differently. The language that's used to talk about them are different. Definitely the paths that you'll go on to get to this end state is different, you know, one school to another. But the state that they all point to is, as far as I can tell, and I've been fortunate enough to study in many different systems, the state that they point to as being the desirable end state or end process would be a better way to put it, because it's not something you simply attain and then put aside and go on to something else. You just, you, as a human being, you, you live a different way, that's all. And, and nothing special. I really think that's important to point out. But the way that I would frame it is this. The majority of us, and I would include myself in this as well, we interact with the world, not directly, but through a model of the world that literally exists between our ears. We have a representation of the real world. And that representation is profoundly structured by our past life experiences um, the people with whom we've interacted where we find ourselves in our life's journey the things that we think are important and hold dear etc 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 these are the things that present the living speaking human being today but as one of my teachers said he said outside that understanding of yourself is actually another you another possibility but you can't see that from your necessarily limited perspective and that's not meant as any kind of criticism until you actually somehow escape tyranny of your own mind if I can put it that way 
the the beliefs about your own personal history and the things that you can do and can't do and all those the things that people talk about when they when they do talk about the things that are important to them or the things in particular that are limiting them you'll see at some point in your practice that the thoughts that up until that instant are how you interact with the world are really just a small subset of a much larger set of experiences which are congruent and going on at the same time as your thought stream and when you see that your thought stream is actually over here in the corner somewhere very small unimportant and what's more if you watch your thoughts enough and this is the whole basis of vipassana the insight meditation you will see the same thoughts the same prejudices the same ideas come up again and again and again it's fascinating to see that you think oh my god there's that thought again and when you can experience that thought from this larger perspective it loses all of its power to do any damage to you or to the people around you now i'm, I'm skating over a lot of chasms here but the whole purpose of any of these processes is to transcend the limited sense of self and to develop a much larger sense of self which as it happens also includes the people that you're interacting with but that's not how people experience their life on a daily basis and so when some guru says ah we're all one that won't mean anything to anyone it just sounds like nonsense doesn't it but as your heart opens there is no doubt in my experience and certainly my students have also reported the same things there is no doubt that as your heart opens the experience of connection to the other people is inevitable it's inevitable and so in our work we don't teach anybody anything in the sense of how to think or how to be or what sort of positions or or, or prejudices are useful or not useful. We don't talk about any of those things. We simply help people to be more relaxed in normal daily life and to be still. This is a critical word. I have not mentioned the word still before today. But if you're interested in being creative and if you're interested in being useful to other people, which is my own personal motivation for doing anything and everything, then you need to acquire the capacity to be still inside yourself because there is no doubt whatsoever that all creativity and any artist who is aware enough to be able to talk about the process that they go through in creation or any writer or i'm sure you too as well you will know that your best inspirations happen to you in the shower or at some other enduring some other activity where the mind is still mm -hmm. now you can't turn off your mind in fact that's a mistake or a, we, we talk about the pathways that don't lead anywhere you'll sometimes go to a meditation class and the teacher up the front will say empty your mind well my answer to that or my response to that now would be look if i could empty my mind i'd already be an expert and i would not need to be here listening to you <laughs> And that is true it is true the capacity to empty your mind is the mark of a, a true adept and it is i can tell you it is possible to do that it is possible to be completely still and to simply experience existence without your mind running at all and certainly not running the show as it normally does and that's extremely desirable even if it's only a place you visit from time to time that's where true rest and true restoration occurs. Anyway, look, I've got a little bit off the topic here, but it's it is a favourite topic of mine. Now, look, I'm going to I'm going to interrupt all of us and to and show you the bottom of my five fingers because I realise that working with athletes as you two do, there's something really important here. Can you see that? This is the little toe side of the five finger. Can you see that black thick rubber, which used to look like that, has completely worn off the little toe? Yeah. yeah. And, and the other toe that it's worn off is the fourth toe. This one here, see how it's half through there? Not on the third toe, not on the second toe, and hardly anything worn off the big toe? Yeah. 
The crazy thing about barefooting or minimalist shoes is it completely changes the way your feet use themselves. And for an athlete, in terms of injury prevention, particularly for knee problems, acquiring the capacity to feel the ground like this and to generate force through the outside of the foot as well as the inside of the foot is absolutely fundamental. So if I were working with any athletes, there would be at least one training session a week where they'd be wearing minimalist shoes or better yet, um, working out in bare feet on an oval. Not, even though it's going to reduce their speed and all the rest because they will actually not know how to, gen how to put their force into the ground without the cushioning of shoes. In the beginning, the body adapts immensely quickly. Um, and two, the, I don't know how many muscles there are in the feet. I can't remember. Is it is 27 bones and how many muscles? I can't remember. It doesn't matter. But I, I've found that with the people that I've worked with, that the majority of modern humans, their feet are chronically weak. So if I were to bring someone into strength training or resistance training, let's call it, because resistance training is a much, much bigger encapsulating concept than strength training or resistance. Yeah, resistance training, anything be resistant, your body can be resistant, for example, like gymnastic strength training. I would definitely do some barefoot work and balance work. Anyway, I'm stopping talking. And I realize that we've gone on for a lot longer than we said we were going for. I'm yeah. wondering, I'm wondering whether um, it's worth stopping here, because there are other things that I need to do today as well. And I'd be very happy to pick up a follow up thing if you would like to do something if some of you are I mean, look, I know that a lot of the stuff that I've spoken about today is probably not directly applicable for many of the people that you're working with, but maybe some of these ideas will, will spark the interest in individual people to try to explore some of these things in a bit more depth. And I promise you that exploration will definitely repay immense benefits if people do do that. Yeah, I think that's... Uh... A great kind of time now to, like to cut this off and maybe come back for another episode kit there are a few things uh i think we can go uh further on that we haven't really discussed but really we want our listeners to gain new perspective on the direction that we would like them to go in understanding you know the journey of this what this is all about it's about so much more than splits and bridges and yeah. things like that. But Absolutely. can I, can I do, before you say something, Jeffrey, I would like to just out of this one thing, it just occurred to me, and I, if I don't utter it now, I'll, I'll forget it. That's the way my brain works these days. I work with a teacher once who said, and if anyone's ever looking for any kind of a reason to do any of these kinds of things, I think this is it. He said, if I ever start a school, he was a, a, a a teacher of these things who only worked one-on-one, -on -one, which incidentally was the way yoga used to be taught too. Um, group classes were invented by Mr. Iyengar uh, up until the modern era. Students, one or two, one student usually, all students would work one-on-one -on -one with their yoga teacher and the yoga teacher might have three or four students and that would be it. And they would be literally, the, the yoga teachers would be supported by their students. Anyway, he said to me, if I ever started school, it would be called the happy for absolutely no reason at all school. Now, this is not an obvious thing, but most people experience their lives as stressful these days. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. And we've, we've canvassed some of those reasons, but this is the pearl, if you like, that exists in the center of all of these teachings. If you unpeel that onion, and unpeel the habit of being stressed and tense and unpeel the habit of protectively holding your body in a particular way and unpeel dot, 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 all the other things that you can unpeel, you suddenly find spontaneously that you are peaceful or happy for no reason at all. And every tradition points to this. There is not one that doesn't offer that as the kind of holy grail, if you like, for doing practice, just to be happy. Yeah. I mean, it's such a simple thing. The reason we say on our site, by the way, um, to experience or to enjoy grace and ease in the body 
and more efficient movement. The reason we chose those words, they're not really special words and they're certainly from a marketing point of view, they are not in any way interesting or attractive. No, they're mm -hmm. not. And that's why we're not viral. That's why we don't have, um, I like that makeup guy who, you know, the very gay guy who does the makeup. He's got 12 and a half million subscribers and he makes about a million bucks a month from his channel. The reason we're not like that is simply because the message that we have is it's too simple and it's unexceptional and unspecial. But if one's normal state were peaceful or happy, that would be a wonderful thing, don't you think? And the world would be a lot nicer place than it is now. And the reason we chose grace and ease as the entry points for our work is that when we talked to people, the first thing that we find is that most people have aches and pains somewhere in their body. Well, when you have aches and pains in your body, you're not experiencing your life as a state of ease or you're not able to move gracefully. You don't feel graceful. Yeah. So we started there. It's not a it's not a spectacular thing, it's just an unusual thing. And it was a thing that for me personally, having worked with dancers and elite athletes and wanting to enjoy um, some of that kind of grace as well. That's why we do the things that we do. And the only promise that we make people and we used to have a money back guarantee in our classes at the university. We ran classes there for 27 years. We said, if you do 70% of the classes or more in a semester, and our semesters were 14 weeks, so that means sort of 10 classes or more out of the 14 weeks, and you're not satisfied with the change in your body, then we'll give you your money back. Not one person ever asked for their money back. Not because they thought we didn't mean it when we said it, we absolutely meant it. But because anyone, everyone who does some of these simple practices will find that they're actually changing themselves from the inside out, not to anyone else's model, not to anyone else's plan. But actually, if I might say, be a bit sort of new agey for a moment, to take the tension out of your body is to reveal the perfection that is inside each of us. And we have no idea what that looks like before you do it. You, just, you don't know. And you will discover gifts inside yourself that you didn't know you had. That's all part of the process. Now you can't make that your objective. It just has to unfold. A bit sort of airy fairy, isn't it? But no, um, you know, it, it... I think it's, I mean, I'm honestly, I'm just sitting over here blown away. I mean, I, I didn't really know what to expect outside of the questions, but I can already tell you, like, I came away with so much. And like, this is one of those things that Lucas and I are probably going to be discussing so much after this is over. But, you know, for me, like, that's really the biggest thing that flexibility has offered me. Um, it's funny because I, like, I don't really get emotional about these things. And I find myself right now doing it because it, it, there's such a self exploration that people, both in the development of strength and, and flexibility, yeah. that people don't really, I don't think, can appreciate until they really, um, you know, take that journey themselves. And I found... Uh, up until that point, it's a concept, Jeffrey. It's yeah. an idea yeah. that might be attractive, maybe. But yeah. until and you feel it, it's just an idea. And that and a dime will get you a phone call in New York, as they say, right? Yeah, and I mean, that was, Lucas and I talk a lot to our athletes about what we call the buy-in, right? And there's, there's, a, there's a moment of clarity in almost any athlete where if you can just convince them to stick with it for just a tiny bit of time, you know, for me, it didn't take long. When I started flexibility, it was probably six to eight weeks of honestly just half ass same belief system most people have this isn't going to work or it's frou-frou or whatever and there was just a moment that I had where I was like this is it and and now and I and that, that was my buy-in that was the moment where I said okay I'm all in I believe this and I've seen just a tiny it was just a tiny tiny improvement but um can I just say it's not that you believed it the, the what came first was the feeling you felt yeah. it and then 
the mind reorganize itself and then you say this is what we all say yes i believe yeah. but the feeling came first didn't it 100 percent. that's exactly this what is it profound was. it's beautiful yeah yeah and it you know it's funny because i'm i'm only you know i'm i'm a pretty young guy i just turned 30 last month and uh, i have two boys two young boys uh one's about to be three and the other's uh almost five months and so um it's funny because i i didn't really notice it until my until their mom basically pointed out to me that i'm just a big kid and and that for for more than more than anything that has that's what this has given me i i don't have to like just i give people my experience as a personal trainer and i don't do personal training anymore for a lot of reasons but one of the biggest takeaways that I had was that most everybody I ever trained over the course of seven or eight years, almost every waking moment that they are alive from the time they wake up to the time they go back to sleep, they experience pain and, and any movement that was like the biggest barrier for me. Um, fortunately I had an understanding, but the biggest barrier for training people was, was getting them to, to understand and kind of talk themselves through the move that the movements that they are doing, like any exercise, pick any exercise you want and ask somebody how it feels when they first start. And they're going to tell you, Oh, it's painful. It's painful. <laughs> what, what, yes. what do you mean? It's, what do you mean? It's painful. Like you just got hit by a car. Like it's painful or, and mm -hmm. then they start to talk. Oh no, it just, you know, it just doesn't like, Oh, that's my, mu you know, they start to, that's your muscle working. Like, you know, they start to have that kind of, the awakening of what it actually feels. And, you know, one of the most beautiful things I think I've ever heard you say, because I've, again, I've listened to everything was that most people don't know what the clothes in their body feel like. And that is, that is the most true thing I have ever heard in my entire life is most people really don't have that awareness of what the clothes, like their shirt on their body feels like, because they just, they're so out of tune. Um, and, and again, one of those things is, is for me, and cause I've worked, I worked, I've worked in, uh, physio settings with, with, with physical therapists. And I've been in that, in that side of it as well. And the most freeing thing is to literally be able to do anything you want to do with your body in any moment of the day and never have to think twice about it. I don't have to think twice about picking up my kid, running with him, throwing him, going to the trampoline park and doing backflips with them. Like I don't have to think, but then I look across the building and every single father in there is sidelined and they're just watching this all occur. And they probably look at me like I'm crazy. I'm having the time of my life and like put the sports aside and, and, and all that stuff. That for me is really my, that's my biggest takeaway. That's my biz, biggest success with it is I just, that's great. I can't even think about how mentally draining it has to be. And I mm -hmm. see it on a daily basis with other people the fact that you have to stop and think about how you're going to move almost every, every single movement you make is just exhausting. Um, but that's what I see. And that's why, that's the, why I've taken this route. And that's why I've tried to, to give it to other people. And it just so happens that Lucas and I, again, like we were, we're not those, we weren't at one point, those guys, we were the go in the gym and, and get the bicep pump. And we still are like, I still very sure. much love that, you know? And, and, um, but to have that whole other side and, and, and for guys that are in our environment, it's hard to take from guys who, you know, I guess you could say look like they do yoga, whereas they see a couple guys who go harder in the gym than they probably do. And then they see us just with the display, this amount of flexibility and it's mind blowing to them. It's just, you know, and, and they're at, we've found like, they're just actually more willing to listen because, you know, again, they've had all these, ideas about what flexibility is and who should have it and who shouldn't. And we don't display that. So you walk the walk and you talk the talk yeah. and that's embodiment, man. That's beautiful. And what about you, Lucas? What's what perspective do you have on that? Well, it's the same. Like I, I kind of began that journey through injury. Um, so I tore my bicep. Same. same. Injury. Yeah, I was in a, yep. Yeah. So the injury, like I had built my body to be able to do three things really, really, really well, squat, mm -hmm. bench and deadlift. And I tore my bicep and realized I was only capable of doing those three things really well. 
And uh, that was just a, a big, big op- eye-opening experience for me. And it came right around to all those things Jeffrey talked about. I just wanted to have access to anything I wanted in my body uh, to move freely with my kids. And um, and that's a lot of people do end up in that situation where they are their backs against the wall and flexibility or um, that mindfulness is like a last resort and kind of saves you, right? Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah, that's... Uh, that's where I kind of started that the whole journey for me, like um, strength training, you know, powerlifting, and then yeah, uh, back was up against the wall, and I had to figure out a way. So flexibility and also gymnastics. I got into uh, gymnastics and um, kind of re- trying to rebuild the body that way too. So hmm. uh, yeah, hundred percent. Like same same as Jeffrey. I, I have three kids and. And it's, it's about moving with them freely, jumping on trains and, you know, being able to uh, live my life the way I want to live it. Um, so. Well, look, you two absolutely are on the right track. I'm, if I were in your area, I would be training with you for sure. I'm, and, it's, and the reason is you're both decent human beings. No one, no one places any weight on, these, on that as a quality. But to be a good human being, to be a decent human being, it's actually... A, a huge it's a it's a massive goal to aspire to because we are surrounded by half human beings or quarter human beings everywhere mm-hmm. being a good human being you can tell when someone's a good human being because they're always a benefit to others just as you two are you are benefiting the people that you come in contact with what is more important than that mm-hmm. And of course, money and those other things flows because you're doing what you're doing well. My, my personal philosophy, I summed it up on a blog post one day, is very simple. Do some good, have some fun, make some money in that order. Yeah. To do some good and have some fun, that's essential. If you're not doing that, in fact, you are not actually in the right, you're not, you have not found your niche yet. If you're still stuck in the cube, as many of my colleagues used to be, you know, working for IT or something and staring at a computer screen 12 hours a day and unhappy about it, you haven't found your niche yet, that's all. And that unhappiness, don't regard that as a negative because unhappiness is the greatest spur to growth of all possible spurs, or in your case, Lucas, injury, same thing, something going wrong. And look, here's my wrap up message to both of you. You're already on the right track, but I can tell you, well, I'm 60, 67 now, I think, something like that. Um, if, I had, if I had a friend who said, I want to go and I would like to do mountain climbing this weekend, are you up for that? I'd say I'm up for that. And would I be world-class mountaineer? Of course not. But I can do, as you said, Jeffrey, anything with my body. If someone said, look, I want to row, we've got a kayaking thing on. Do you want to come not row competitively, but would you like to row around to this other harbour? It's about two or three miles or something. So sure. If I felt like it, sure. You want to be plastic, not 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 the littering kind of plastic, but plastic in the morphological sense. You want your body to be in the middle of a conceptual triangle where we have flexibility or range of movement at one corner, strength at another corner and aerobic capacity on at the third corner and you're somewhere in the middle where you're not world class in any of those things but you have that all of those attributes so that you can respond you you both have children I, the fact that you both love playing with your kids is just such a fantastic thing it's so good for them it's in, in just 10,000 ways is that good for them but also too when life throws a challenge in your way you very likely be able to respond how cool yeah. is that? Isn't that's, that wonderful? That's, that's beyond. Yeah. Why don't we say goodbye there today, gentlemen?